Canon is a funny thing. Stuff can be altered and changed on a whim just because one writer doesn't like a decision that another writer made, or because editorial mandated a really dumb decision that ends up affecting the entire universe. Like Dick Grayson becoming Rick Grayson. Or most of the decisions that Dan Didio's mandated. But just like in comics, we're also starting to see the continuity get fuzzier and fuzzier in the movies as well. With the introduction of characters like the X-Men into the MCU, and DC taking a straight up f**k it approach to continuity altogether. So I wanted to make a video just talking about canon and some of its wider implications, as well as why DC's approach may actually be better than Marvel's in the long term. A lot of the people in my Discord server have been talking about a theoretical cinematic universe of movies that may or may not be connected. This is the early 2000s pre-MCU, and there's actually a little bit of evidence that suggests that these films might be connected after all. There's this Wolverine reference from the 2005 Fantastic Four movie. I guess that's what I thought you always wanted. A stronger man. And it's been reported that Wolverine was actually supposed to have a cameo in the Spider-Man 2002 movie, but they just couldn't get the costume in time. Allegedly, Wolverine would be saving bystanders during the parade scene when Green Goblin first shows up. And then him and Spider-Man would talk briefly after Spider-Man dropped off MJ. But there were other characters that were supposed to cross over too. The Punisher stunt double actually shows up in a single shot of Spider-Man 2. And this was intended to be a cameo, but had to be reworked because of the character rights issues. So this one doesn't really count, but it's a fun little side note. And then there's this one blooper from the first Fox X-Men movie. Wait! <laughs> I, I am completely... I don't think that one's proof either, I just think it's funny. But because of all those loose connections and weird theories, I feel like it's definitely possible that all these movies could be canon to each other. I'm not saying that it's definitive proof of anything, I'm just saying that it's a solid game theory. And it definitely seems like that was the original intention, when you consider this deleted line from Iron Man back in 2008, before they decided to make it its own alternate universe when the original intention was to build the MCU on top of the Fox X-Men and Sony Spider-Man stuff, instead of alongside of it. As if gamma accidents, radioactive bug bites, and assorted mutants weren't enough. I have to deal with a spoiled brat who doesn't play well with others and wants to keep all his toys to himself. Who the hell are you? Nick Fury, director of S.H.I.E.L.D. I'm here to talk to you about the Avenger Initiative. Well, what are we avenging? Whatever the hell we want. Hold on, those aren't the only X-Men movies. What about First Class and everything that came after that? Great question, Six. My theory about that goes like this. After Days of Future Past happened and Wolverine changed the timeline, the old pre-MCU became this new universe instead. Kinda like Flashpoint, where Flash went back in time to save his mom and turned Batman into a raging murder machine through the butterfly effect. But the only real evidence I have for that is weaker than the Punisher cameo I mentioned before. There was a Days of Future Past post credit scene in The Amazing Spider-Man 2, kind of anyway. This was a part of some kind of marketing deal that Sony had made with Fox. And it wasn't a real after credit scene, they kind of just showed the trailer for Days of Future Past after The Amazing Spider-Man 2. So it's not definitive, all of this is still headcanon until something is officially confirmed. Like I said before, it's all just a game theory. But what I'm trying to get at is that even if it is just a game theory, it's all still possible. And canon might work better if we treated it like it was possible. If we treated canon as being a little bit looser and we weren't constricted by Earth 1000 X dash whatever. I think that treating everything as being that encyclopedic kind of impedes storytelling and it stops authors from being able to experiment and do what they want with the characters and lore. If we did treat canon as being a little bit looser, we could create larger worlds like this, out of smaller stories like this. I have a really hard time dealing with people who have a really strict view on what is and isn't canon. Like the people who claim Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. isn't canon just because the movies don't reference it, 
even though, you know, he, Nick Fury showing up with the Helicarrier in Age of Ultron makes no sense without Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Season 2, but still. People claim that, even though there are references between all the Marvel television shows, and also ignoring the fact that one of the characters introduced and featured mainly in Agent Carter has a cameo in the biggest Marvel crossover movie of all time. And these are all the same people that insist that the Peggy who died in the main timeline during Civil War never married Cap. They claim that Captain America went back in time and married another Peggy in the alternate timeline that they had stolen the stones from, even though the writers and directors have said otherwise. But to be fair, the writers and directors have contradicted each other on that at some points. But again, what I'm getting at is that all of that needless nitpicking just complicates the story too much. Can't we just say he was always her husband? I mean, after all, Peggy Carter was one of history's greatest spies, and maybe Steve had brought one of those face-changing masks from Winter Soldier back in time with him. Who knows? But what I'm saying is that we shouldn't treat canon like the law of the land the way we do. Why does it matter if Quaker Daredevil exists alongside the Guardians of the Galaxy and Doctor Strange? Because from my perspective, Howard the Duck existing in the 616 never hurt the grim and gritty tones of books like Punisher Warzone or Miller's Daredevil. So what does it really matter? Just let the characters coexist and don't think about it too much. Just have fun with it because that's what these movies and books are supposed to be. They're supposed to be fun. And in my opinion, making your own interpretation is one of the most important parts of observing art. And headcanon is a natural extension of that now that we have these long, sprawling universes of film and television, along with stories and arcs that can sometimes go on for decades at a time. So considering all of that, I think that Deadpool is the perfect example of why looser continuity in a series of soft resets could really benefit these cinematic universes more than it would hurt them. Deadpool tends to be interpreted as taking place mainly in the Fox X-Men universe post Days of Future Past. But I don't think that's the only timeline it could take place in. I mean, sure, it does reference a lot of events from the Fox Cinematic Universe, but it also references DC movies and the MCU itself. So before I go any further, consider the DC Comics approach. Like I mentioned earlier, the DC movies are taking a looser approach to continuity by letting multiple versions of characters coexist with each other without explicitly referencing what universe the story is set in. And the comics do something extremely similar. Batman Year One is canon to the post-crisis DC continuity, meaning that books like Batman Long Halloween feature characters from Year One and serve almost as a direct continuation of that point in the timeline. And all of this is canon to the post-crisis continuity. But, on the other hand, Batman Year One is also canon to The Dark Knight Returns. But Batman Long Halloween is not canon to The Dark Knight Returns, because The Dark Knight Returns features characters that die in Long Halloween and its sequel, Dark Victory, thus meaning that at some point the timelines diverge. And that same approach can even be seen across continuity in other media as well, like Star Wars. It's in Star Wars that the flaws of having a really tightly knit and strict continuity really begin to show. The universe was recently segregated into two parts, the mainline Disney continuity and the Legends continuity. All of the content made after the Disney merger, meaning stuff like the EA Battlefront games and Marvel Comics, are considered to be the new canon. But everything before the merger is now considered to be Legends continuity which puts characters from games like KOTOR and Republic Commandos in a really weird position, mainly because the characters from those two games actually show up and get referenced in the Clone Wars TV show. And the Clone Wars TV show is still considered canon to the Disney universe, even though the games that these characters came from aren't canon to the new continuity anymore. So despite the fact that some of these games introduce key figures to the lore like Darth Bane, a character that even has a cameo appearance and gets brought up multiple times in the show, the game that he originally appeared in isn't canon, even though the character that originated in it still is, which lights Clone Wars in a really weird and confusing place, where it's canon to both Legends and Disney continuity, but some of the things that are canon to it aren't canon to the Disney continuity. And I imagine that if Sony and Marvel hadn't made a deal, and they really had removed Spider-Man from the MCU, 
something like that would have ended up happening there as well. I don't feel so good. And it's rumored that if the two had split, then Venom and Morbius would be the new co-stars of Spider-Man in this weird half-Spider-Verse with all the obscure Spider-Man characters that no one gives a shit about, like Nightwatch and Jackpot. How the fuck would a Madam Web movie even make sense? It just sounds so fucking stupid. So like I said, if there had been no deal, then Homecoming and Far From Home would have been in the exact same position as Batman Year One, placing it in the weird spot of being canon to two different universes at the same time. And remember, that deal they just made was only for two movies, so in two or three years, there's going to be a whole nother Save Spidey campaign all over again. I mean, geez, can you imagine if people got this upset and decided to influence change in actual productive ways? Like Flint, Michigan still has a ton of lead in their water, there are still protests against Chinese censorship happening in Hong Kong, or the fact that Edward Snowden has been trapped in an airport for almost a decade for being a hero and blowing the whistle on government corruption. She's disabling security protocols and dumping all the secrets onto the internet. Including hydras. And shields. If you do this, none of your past is going to remain hidden. Not Budapest, not Osaka, not the Children's War. Are you sure you're ready for the world to see you as you really are? Are you? These are all things that are a lot more important than Spider-Man being in the MCU. Or the war that these multi-million dollar corporations are waging with each other while they try to make us and our favorite art pieces pawns in the middle of it. But try telling that to Twitter, I guess. I don't want to stop global warming. I want Spider-Man in the MCU. Oh, and uh, by the way, Jeffrey Epstein didn't kill himself, just in case you didn't know. Cease your investigations. But if my game theory is true, and Deadpool 1 really does take place in the MCU, then it wouldn't even be the first time an MCU movie takes place in two film universes at once. Which brings me to the weird relationship between the movies Hulk and Incredible Hulk. The Incredible Hulk was originally intended to be a sequel to the 2003 Universal movie, but the script got rewritten by Edward Norton to make it more vague and ambiguous as to what continuity it was set in. The main connection between the two is that Hulk 2003 ends in South America, with Bruce beginning the path that'll lead him to learning how to control his powers, and Hulk 2008 starts in South America, with Bruce having gotten better at keeping his rage in check. And before you leave a comment telling me that they're clearly in separate continuities because of the aesthetical difference in the flashback scenes of Hulk's origins, or the actors changing, remember, Batman Forever is technically canon to the Tim Burton movies and Two-Face went from Lando to... oh hell no. Plus actors, including the Hulk himself, have been recast inside the MCU. And another thing I think you should consider is that the exact same amount of time between the Hulk and the Incredible Hulk releasing is the exact same amount of time between the Incredible Hulk and the Avengers. So the two movies really aren't that far removed from each other, and again, I'm not saying anything is definite, I'm just saying that it's possible and it's a fun game theory. It's just headcanon, you know? Nothing has to be confirmed to have fun with playing with the idea of it. So in that same way that The Incredible Hulk can fit into continuity with either cinematic universe, I think that there are a few reasons that Deadpool can do that too. And the main one is that during the final battle of the movie, they're actually fighting on top of a giant helicarrier in the junkyard. And I don't know if you remember or not, but just two years earlier, around the same time that Deadpool would have been in the early stages of production, Winter Soldier came out, and in Winter Soldier, Captain America crashed three giant helicarriers into the Potomac. So I think that the helicarrier from the giant fight of Deadpool could very well be one of those helicarriers from Winter Soldier. If this doesn't make sense, then that's okay. It doesn't have to, and it doesn't need to. But what I'm saying is that canon isn't always mutually exclusive. We've already established that a story can take place in two universes at the same time, with different events coming before or after it. And given that Deadpool is a character that's very well aware of the outside world and the viewer watching him, it lends more opportunity for him to cross over and even poke fun at the weird continuity shift. Let us go talk to the professor. McAvoy or Stewart, these timelines are so confusing. Just imagine if Deadpool showed up in the MCU unexplained and unannounced, 
only addressing it by telling the audience not to think too hard about it, implying that he snuck in without Disney's permission, or just Deadpool breaking the fourth wall to make fun of the confusing continuity. I think that not explaining Deadpool being in the MCU could just make his presence that much funnier. Honestly, I think the only issues that come with making Deadpool 1 canon would be that Deadpool 2 explicitly references the Fox films to a more major degree. But in a weird way, there are actually a lot of reasons that we could always just ignore Deadpool 2. And the main reason we could ignore Deadpool 2 is that technically it might not have even happened. Remember Deadpool going back in time to fight Wolverine and save Vanessa? And basically rewriting the timeline so that nothing bad ever happened in the movie? I think that that implies that Deadpool 2 might not have even happened and also because these guys make a cameo appearance that ruins the possibility of the movie being set in the MCU as well. Plus the fact that the time travel rules in this movie directly contradict the rules from Endgame. But considering that the end of Deadpool 2 retcons pretty much most, if not all of Deadpool 2, then I don't think that the movie ever needs to be brought up again, outside of Deadpool's relationships with other mercenaries like Domino and Cable and you don't really need to re-explain their origins. They could just be there alongside the rest of the universe whenever the X-Men are introduced. There might be a few slight continuity errors here and there, but that can all be explained away or ignored pretty easily. And I think the reason that we can ignore or explain away some of those continuity errors is that just like DC does all the time, I think the MCU is about to get a soft reboot as well. And I think that it's going to be Scarlet Witch that initiates that. And I think that's because we'll see a movie adaption of the House of M storyline carried out through WandaVision and the Multiverse of Madness. Going back to the DC continuity for a second, in Infinite Crisis, the multiverse was broken when Superboy Prime punched reality in the face. And that served as a soft reset to bring back a lot of dead characters and rewrite some of the more grim and gritty stories from the 90s that clashed with the more contemporary grounded stories of the early 2000s. And just like Infinite Crisis and Flashpoint were soft resets for DC, I think WandaVision and Multiverse of Madness will be a soft reset for the MCU. Going off of rumors and speculation, WandaVision is supposed to take place in a 1950s sitcom that takes place in a sort of pocket reality. It can be assumed that she created this reality to bring Vision back to life and live out a fantasy life with him that she never would have been able to otherwise. And this is kind of similar to the House of M storyline from the comic books, where Wanda has a breakdown after the deaths of her children, and rewrote all of existence so that mutants never existed. So I think that when they undo the pocket universe from WandaVision, it could lead to one of the biggest revelations about the MCU yet. I think it could reveal that the MCU as we know it now is actually the cinematic House of M universe. Through her reality warping powers, Wanda turned some sort of original universe into the MCU so that mutants never existed and Magneto wasn't her father. But through the cosmic awareness of the stones, seeking out some sort of multiversal correction, Wanda and Pietro were given their powers back without ever even knowing they had lost them in the first place. Remember what Hydra said about everyone else dying in the experiments except for her and her brother? What if the only reason that Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch survived was because the stones wanted them to survive? The stones put Scarlet Witch, Quicksilver, and Vision in the right place at the right time to make sure that they would be able to bring back the mutants, allowing the cosmic balance to correct itself once again. But I don't think it's as simple as Wanda snapping her fingers and bringing the X-Men back. I think that all of these cosmic shifts and timeline changes will still have major repercussions in the next big crossover 10 years from now. The repercussions I think that the MCU is going to have to deal with is the diverging dark timelines that the Ancient One warned about, the stones being destroyed in Endgame, and what I'll assume is Wanda treating the timeline like Play-Doh in WandaVision and Multiverse of Madness. I think all of this happening so close together is going to result in something in the multiverse breaking. And when that happened in the comics, it caused incursions. The incursions were when the walls between realities started to break down and the worlds began collapsing in on each other. Which ended up leading to Secret Wars, where Doctor Doom created Battle World from the remains of the fractured multiverse. So I think that 10 years from now, the next big two-part crossover event will feature the incursions in the first movie, and then it'll adapt Secret Wars and Battle World in the second movie. But going back to what I said before, both Wanda bringing back the mutants and the destruction and recreation of the multiverse in Secret Wars 
could serve as great soft resets to the universe that let them explain things like Deadpool 1 taking place in the MCU, or letting minor characters who might have died on shows like Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. be featured elsewhere. And these soft reboots that end up resulting in the timeline or multiverse changing also lets them do hard reboots on shows like Inhumans, without really affecting anything that might have referenced the show or anything the show might have referenced itself. Which would basically let everyone have their cake and eat it too, with the old Inhumans show taking place before the universe changed, and the new Inhumans show or movie taking place after the universe changes. That way they could, you know, make it good this time. So that about does it for my thoughts on continuity in superhero movies. Plus a few additional theories on how Disney is going to handle, you know, the mutant situation. So if you agree with what I had to say, or if you have a contradicting theory of your own, I'd love to hear it in the comments down below. And don't forget to drop a like if you enjoyed the video. And lastly, maybe consider subscribing if you'd like to see more Super Swim Team 7 in the future. I'd also like to give a very special thank you to the supporters on Patreon and Kofi, as well as a very special friend of the channel, Uncle Dave. Just when I thought I wasn't going to reach my year-end goal of 1,000 subscribers, Uncle Dave and his magical friends came in, gave me a shout-out, and helped me pass my year-end goal. So if you would be so kind as to leave a thank you Uncle Dave in the comments, and maybe check out his channel and website, neongrizzly.com, we'd really appreciate it. With all that being said, this has been Swim Team Captain 7, signing off.